Um, targets for CO2 reduction. What is the proposal from the European Commission to, to strengthen, to tighten our targets for CO2 reduction? Because obviously we already have targets for CO2 reduction, uh, but how are they uh, made more ambitious? I already showed you this. Um, this graph, I, I won't explain it again, but it's a good reference point uh, to start the discussion. So we, we, we already agreed to reducing emissions in 2030 by 55% in Europe. Now the question is, how do we, how do we get there? Well, um, let's start with the current binding target, because the 55% is not, um, it, it was the, sorry, the 40% was the, the previous target, 55% is the new target, but let's start with the 40%. Again, the base year was 1990. Now to, to, um, to go after this, to try to achieve this target, Europe um, actually splits the entire economy in half. Like, and on the one hand side, you have big factories, big emitters, big companies, multinationals that compete on a European or uh, global scale, also the aviation sector. Um, and these type of companies actually want a level playing field, right? They compete with, internationally with each other, so you wouldn't want um, carbon pricing, for example, to be different in the Netherlands than it is in Germany or Belgium or uh, Italy or anywhere else in Europe. So a level playing field is very important. Also, big factories with chimneys, with, with point sources, as they're called, with a lot of CO2 from one point, is relatively easy it's not easy, but relatively easy uh, to abate CO2 there. So we basically um, uh, 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 um, uh, split the economy between those type of companies and on the other hand, more regional uh, sectors like um, the built environment, uh, transport, agriculture, they typically don't compete on the global level. Um, emission sources are more fragmented, maybe harder to abate, and if you're talking about SMEs or households, uh, you're talking about completely different um, policy instruments. So this target of 40% was split up uh, in, in, in two. So the bulk of the reduction actually was expected to be uh, attained in these uh, sectors with big chimneys, big factories that operate on a global scale. Minus 43% versus 2005. Mind you, the base year has changed here. All targets do still add up to the 40% in 1990. And these other sectors that are more regional in nature, smaller actors, smaller SMEs, households, agri-transport, uh, they have a target, they had a target of minus 30% uh, in versus 2005. Now the proposal is to, uh, oh, by the way, the, the sectors on the left-hand side are called emission trading scheme sectors, ETS sectors, and, uh, because they're all covered by one policy instrument, the ETS. And the, the sectors on the right-hand side are called effort sharing regulation sectors, ESR sectors. Important distinction, that's why we start with it, because, uh, well, well, we'll get to how, how, how emission reduction in both of those sectors works in a bit. Now, the overall target has already been uh, set to minus 55%. But in the proposal of the European com com Commission, there is now also a proposal how to transpose this basically to these ETS sectors on the one hand side and ESR sectors. ETS sectors will now have to um, attain a goal of minus 61% and ESR sectors uh, are, um, would have to uh, uh, obtain a target of minus 40%. So both sectors will have to do more, but still the bulk of the reduction should come from ETS sectors. Now how do we, so that's still the, not how we get there, but just the target, right? So how do we get there for ETS sectors? I already mentioned we have an emission trading scheme for these ETS sectors. That's sort of the instrument that, um, uh, that ensures that all of these uh, companies um, are exposed to the same carbon price. How does it work? Well, very simply stated, it's a balloon with emission credits, emission allowances. A balloon means it's capped. There's a, a finite number of emission allowances in the balloon, um, uh, a finite number to make sure that we meet the minus 43% emission reduction target for these sectors. Um, 
companies are only allowed to emit CO2 or other greenhouse gases if they have a, an allowance. If they don't have an allowance for that emission, they will actually face severe penalties and you know, they can just shut down. Uh, so, it's, so they will have to commit, they will have to make sure that they have sufficient emission allowances from this ETS balloon to cover their emissions. And again, the number is, the, of allowances is capped, it's finite, the balloon is closed. Uh, as more and more allowances are, uh, are used, they become scarcer and the price of CO2 rises. Now, how do we obtain a minus 61% target? Well, very simply, we deflate the balloon. And that's exactly uh, what the European Commission is proposing. Air, um, air uh, uh, sorry, planes, uh, air travel is also um, uh, covered by the ETS. Um, and uh, intra-European flights are covered by, the, by this ETS balloon, so they will have to make sure that they have sufficient allowances to cover their emissions, and they will face a CO2 price. Um, um, the extra-European flights, so flights to and from the European Union, for example, a flight to the US or from the US to, um, to, to Europe, to the Netherlands, for example, um, that, those type of flights are not uh, part of this balloon. But part of the Green Deal proposal is to cover them under the Corsia proposal. What is Corsia? Corsia is basically an industry initiative by the um, uh, air travel <laughs> uh, industry. And the, the objective of Corsia, as air travel is set to expand and grow over the next few decades, as, uh, as obviously economic growth in big parts of the world is only driving people to fly more and more, um, the objective here is to keep emissions um, at the 2020 level. So, be car so carbon neutral growth, as it's termed, from 2020 onwards. Carbon neutral growth can be obtained in various ways. First of all, through operational improvements. Secondly, aircraft technology, so aircraft design um, and uh, more fuel efficient aircraft. Thirdly, from sustainable aviation fuel, so replacing kerosene with other sustainable initiatives, more on that later, um, and Corsia, because there will still probably be a part of these emissions that will um, um, likely, um, uh, that they will uh, grow above the 2020 level. And we don't want that, we want carbon neutral growth. So what is the Corsia proposal here? to actually offset those emissions, for example, by planting trees or other offsetting mechanisms. And um, the European Commission is actually proposing to make this mandatory for flights to and from the EU. So that was a bit on more, more on the ETS sectors later on in other chapters. That was a bit on the, on the ETS sectors. We now move to the ESR sectors. So these more local, smaller businesses um, uh, that have a different reduction target, currently minus 30%. These sectors are called emission uh, effort sharing regulation sectors, and from this graph you can immediately see why it's called, wh why they're termed effort sharing sectors, because the effort is literally shared between the countries. Not everybody, uh, not every country has a minus 30% target, but countries like Sweden, Finland, Luxembourg, Germany, they're close to or at minus 40% currently, and a country like Bulgaria is at 0%. That doesn't mean they have, uh, that they don't have to do anything, because obviously if you grow e economically and do nothing, do not become more energy efficient or whatever, then probably emissions will rise. Uh, but obviously, the, the bulk of the effort is on the countries on the, the right-hand side, um, uh, also because they're probably more able to do, or uh, other countries are allowed more space for, um, for economic development. Um, now, the proposal is to, to, to change this setup, right? The, so the overall target should go from minus 30 to minus 40%. And that actually means that all countries will have to do more. So on the right-hand side, we now see Sweden, Finland, Luxembourg, Germany moving to minus 50%. And also Bulgaria on the left-hand side now has a minus 10% reduction target in ESR sectors. Uh, I think the only country that has, still has the same reduction target for ESR sectors is Malta. Um, now, I know what you're thinking. 
you're thinking, wow, I, I really can't read this graph. And I want to know <laughs> the specific numbers for my country. So that's why I made this uh, specific slide with, uh, with all the flags. So to, for you to easily browse through, you see the countries, the old ESR target on the left-hand side and the new ESR target on the right-hand side. So Austria going from minus 36 to minus 48. Poland going from minus 7 to minus 17.7. Uh, Germany, minus 38, going to minus 50%, um, etc., etc. Belgium, minus 35 to minus 47%. Um, again, this video is on YouTube tomorrow, so uh, if you want to go back to these numbers, check it out. Um, because now I go to the summary for this chapter. We, we, we've come at the end of this chapter. Um, Every chapter, I quickly summarize, um, uh, we, we're going from minus 40% to minus 55% overall for uh, 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 greenhouse gases. The, that target is split up between ETS sectors on the one hand side and ESR sectors. ETS sectors will have to reduce emissions by 61% if it's up to the European Commission and ESR sectors. That really depends on the specific country you're talking about. The Netherlands would have to meet a minus 48% target. Germany would have to go <clears throat> to minus 50%. And the Czech Republic would have to go to minus 26%. I do want to reiterate, I already said it at the start, negotiations are now starting. These are targets for 2030. As you saw, this is quite a big step up for many countries in these sectors. Um, I mean, making the ETS scheme more uh, uh, tighter is actually, you know, you, you deflate the balloon. We have mechanisms for that um, on a European, pan-European level. But reduction in ESR sectors may be uh, more difficult or a lot of policy instruments on, on, on member state level would have to be adapted to meet that target. So if we lose a lot of year, years on negotiations uh, on maybe the nitty gritty, then we, we may face a, a, a lot less time for actually execution, which may be, turn out to be a lot, lot harder. So that's a very important trade-off uh, to be aware of. Let me check out if there are any uh, questions. Um, how will the EU deal with insufficient energy from green sources to support the sustainable growth of the industry? Yeah, a uh, very good question. The next uh, chapter will also be on uh, renewable energy targets. So there are separate mechanisms to also boost the availability of renewable energy. And you, you'll see throughout this masterclass several initiatives on a sector level to make sure that uh, these uh, fuels or green electricity uh, is available. But the, and, and this is maybe also why all these proposals come at once, because you really need a systems view and a comprehensive approach to, uh, to, to, to this green transformation. Um, you can't just, uh, let's say, uh, let um, uh, CO2 prices rise on the, uh, at the industry side and not develop uh, green alternatives at the same time and the infrastructure in between and have the correct pricing mechanisms and policies to support it. So, um, uh, yeah, very important. Um, how can developing countries exporting to the European Union, for example, food and agricultural products, better adapt to the EU Green Deal programs like Farm to Fork or the potential carbon tax? Um, well, in, in general, uh, countries exporting to the EU will, um, uh, if their counterparts uh, that produce the same products uh, are covered by an ETS scheme, so if, uh, pay a CO2 price here, uh, if the EU Green Deal is passed, they will have to pay the same CO2 price um, at, the, at the border. Um, that is actually currently not the case for agricultural products specifically, uh, but it is definitely something uh, that is very relevant for, for a lot of sectors that currently export to the um, uh, European Union. So really watch out for the first chapter after the break. Um, in order to achieve the targets for transport, electrification of the fleet of vehicles has to be huge, requiring a massive increase of charging points. Expansion of charging points in public spaces, space will not be sufficient. 
How to cope with the lack of charging points for households, especially in cities? Will this be regulated as well? Uh, more on the uh, very good questions. Um, uh, the uh, charging infrastructure will be covered in the uh, chapter on sustainable infrastructure. It is almost at the end um, of this masterclass. The, not the final chapter, but the one before that. Um, can ETS sectors purchase carbon credits from voluntary carbon uh, markets? They, um, they, well, there, there, there will be multiple ETSs. So um, it, it probably depends on um, uh, the, the ETS uh, you're talking about. Uh, at the current ETS, it was to some extent possible to buy um, uh, credits from voluntary markets. I don't think that uh, that is uh, uh, a substantial chunk, though, or that it is going to be continued also for these new. ETSs, but um, and I honestly in this masterclass I do that is something where I maybe can't be complete today. Uh, I will not cover the voluntary markets, but mostly focus on the design changes or new implementation of ETSs. So again, happy to follow up on that um, uh, afterwards. Corsia and other offsetting strategies seems like greenwashing rather than actionable climate protection. What are your thoughts on this? Should we be happy enough with offsetting strategies solely? Um, offsetting, this is my personal view, um, offsetting should always be the option of last resort. Like the, the, the primary option should be to reduce your emissions, right? To make sure that the offsetting is not necessary. Um, I also know um, ETS, uh, plans earlier um, almost triggered in in for the airline industry almost triggered the trade trade war earlier. So this is a very um, uh, sen a very sensitive topic, and I I guess uh, a lot will depend on what other regions in the world, maybe the U.S. or other continents, what what they develop in terms of plans to 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 introduce carbon taxes. Um, I I think this is simply the option of last resort and, and that they are betting on this because more stringent targets are uh, uh, instruments at this point are uh, not easy to implement. Uh, but you know it can be a step change. Um, as we see for the maritime industry, they're, they're now moving to, uh, to an actual ETS with uh, CO2 pricing. Uh, they, they for a long time have been under a monitoring ver verification uh, 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 scheme where they didn't pay uh, a CO2 price, but we're just reporting their emissions. Of course, reporting by itself is not enough, but it was a step change and it was a necessary step to now introduce the ETS. So again, the end goal is 2050. We were a lot of new proposals here to meet the 2030 target, uh, but it's definitely not the end game. This is, this, these proposals will get us to 2030.